Okay. So this is the third in the, in the DWW series called um, Falling for a Good Book, Young Adult Authors. Um, and we have a number of, of outstanding authors lined up for you tonight. Um, so welcome, and uh, I hope you enjoy the program. Uh, the other two were well received and, and nicely done. So I hope you enjoy this one too. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Roberta Brown, and as president of Detroit Working Writers, I welcome you to our third and final session in the series of Falling for a Good Book, featuring members of Detroit Working Writers. DWW was founded 120 years ago to encourage creative writing of the highest professional standard and to act as a creative and professional resource for its members and for the community at large. I will put our contact information in terms of our website, Facebook and Twitter pages and handles in the chat box once we get going. I would like to thank our program chair, Barbara Rubick, who will be one of our readers tonight for arranging this series. And I'd also definitely like to thank the two staff people of the Royal Oak Public Library who are here tonight, Matthew Day, who you just heard from, who's the adult services librarian, and the, uh, the logo of the, the library that you see with the park benches in sunnier days when the leaves still had trees. Uh, this is Ed Pank, who is our library technology specialist and webmaster wizard. Uh, we also thank all of our readers tonight, Kristen Bartley Lenz, Jean Alicia Elster, Barbara Rebeck, Teresa Nielsen, and Diane Vanderbeck Mager, who we will be hearing from in short order. Uh, as you have questions, as Matt mentioned, you can put them in the chat box and we will entertain them after each of our speakers. Our main featured speaker tonight is Kristen Bartley Lentz, who is a writer and social worker. She has lived in Michigan, Georgia, and California. Her debut young adult novel, The Art of Holding On and Letting Go, was the 2016 Helen Sheehan Young Adult Book Prize winner a 2016 Junior Library Guild selection, and an honor book for the 2017-2018 Great Lakes Great Books Award. Her fiction, poetry, essays, and articles have been published by Hunger Mountain, Great Lakes Review, The Allen Review, Literary Mama, Wow, Women on Writing, The New Social Worker, and Writer's Digest. She also writes freelance for Detroit area nonprofits and manages the Mitten blog for the Michigan chapter of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. So I present to you, Kristen Bartley Lenz. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I was happy to get this invitation because um, I do live in Royal Oak and the library is one of my favorite places. And it would have been very fun if we could have been in person like this was planned last spring. But alas, I do see some familiar names out there. So I'll thank you all for tuning in tonight. I have a little tiny laptop in front of me and a big monitor, and I tend to want to go to the big monitor, so I apologize if I'm not always looking at you, but I will try. Um, the library, like I said, is one of my favorite places. I am there almost every week, and um, this is are the books that I have checked out this week. Oh, there's more. <laughs> right? So this is very typical of me um, and I've been this way ever since I was a little kid. So I've always been a big reader and a writer and it's what I thought I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, but something shifted in my teen and my 
college years and I, I just lost confidence in my writing. I didn't know what to write about. I wasn't sure of my voice. I didn't want to share my writing with anybody. Um, so I ended up choosing some of my other interests and I majored in psychology and then I went and got my master's degree in social work. Um, and I moved all around the country. I went from Michigan to Georgia to California and then back to Michigan. And in each of those places, I had a different type of social work job. And um, so social work was a, a detour on my writing path, quite a big one, but it really expanded my worldview. I met so many different people and I, I, my world just really grew. So by the time I came back to writing, I I, I had a lot more confidence. I knew what I wanted to say. I knew what I wanted to write about. But I also knew that I really had a lot to learn about the craft and business of writing. So when I went to one of my first writing conferences, uh, and it was through SCBWI, which is the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And if you have an interest in writing for children on up through teens, um, that's a great place to start. Their website is just full of all kinds of information. But at this first conference that I went to, the main speaker, said that the average time it takes for a writer to get published is 10 years. 10 years, which was such a shocking number. And I thought, okay, well, on the one hand, this isn't so bad, right? It takes some of the pressure off. I can, I can take my time learning and, um, and, and working on my craft and practicing. And there's not all this pressure here. I'll get there eventually. And on the other hand, though, I thought, there's no way it's going to take 10 years. I mean, come on, right? I am focused and I am motivated and I am dedicated. And and sure enough, I worked hard and I wrote two novels um, while I was working full time and I had a toddler at home with a lot of thanks to my parents for doing quite a bit of babysitting. Um, and within a few years, I had an, a literary agent. So I thought, all right, yes, right. This hard work paid off and I'm ahead of the curve. Um, but that's when I learned that uh, just because you have an agent, it doesn't mean that they're gonna be able to sell your book. So having an agent was an important step. It was really validating. Um, agents don't get paid until they sell your book. So if they decide to represent you, it means that they love your work and that they're pretty confident they're gonna be able to sell it. Um, but there are so many factors involved. It just doesn't always work out. So to make a long story short, uh, it ended up taking 10 years in order to get my one book published. Um, it took 10 years, three different manuscripts, two different agents, uh, way too many rejections, um, and just enough encouragement and praise and contest wins to keep me going until um, I finally found the editor who shared my vision and wanted to publish my work. And that ended up being through a small press, through a contest that I won, um, which was yet another big detour because my agent had me on track to be published by one of the larger New York publishing houses. And here I was veering off to Connecticut with this small press. And I was a little nervous about it. Um, all small presses are not made equal and um, you really have to do your research, which I did in this case. And um, there were very tiny press but they had a good track record of publishing good quality and award-winning books. And um, it ended up working out. I had a great experience with my editor and I, I really grew so much as a writer through that process. So um, my book, so The Art of Holding On and Letting Go was the third novel that I wrote. The first two will probably never be published, but they were good practice. Um, the fourth, my fourth novel is with my agent right now. I have a new agent um, and he is submitting it to uh, back again to try the New York publisher route um, and submitting during a pandemic is has its whole, a whole nother level of challenges. Uh, so I don't know where that's gonna take me. Um, and my fifth book is the one that I'm working on right now. 
So The Art of Holding On and Letting Go is considered a young adult novel, um, which means it's for teens and older. And if you are an adult who hasn't read a teen or young adult novel in a long time, I think you will be really surprised at the level of sophistication and depth that are in these stories. And the same goes for middle grade too. Um, all of children's writing um, is, is written with multiple layers and, and meanings for numerous audiences. So I think one of the, the best parts about um, being an author is all the different connections that you make with a variety of people. And you know, the my book, the title comes from because my main character is a rock climber. So, you know, you need to hold on and let go as you climb up a cliff. But it's also um, but it also means the emotional journey of holding on and letting go. And you know, that's a, a really universal experience that we all go through it at multiple points in our lives. Um, through various losses and changes. So I've received letters from readers from, you know, 12 year old seventh graders on up through 80 year old grandparents and um, all of them relating to the teen character in my book and the challenges that she goes through. And um, so, yeah, all those connections, uh, I think that's the best part of being an author. So I am going to do just a little bit of reading. I'm going to save most of the storytelling for the other authors to come later tonight because we have four more ahead. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit and I'm going to start with the, the back cover of my book um, because it's a summary so you'll know what it's about. So here we go. When every piece falls into place, it's like a dance, a delicate but powerful balancing act the art of holding on and letting go at the same time. Competitive climber Kara Jenkins feels most at home high off the ground, clinging to a rock wall by her fingertips. She's enjoyed a roaming life with her mountaineering parents, making the natural world her jungle gym, the writings of Annie Dillard and Henry David Thoreau her textbooks. But when tragedy strikes on an Ecuadorian mountaintop, Kara's nomadic lifestyle comes to an abrupt halt. Starting over at her grandparents' home in suburban Detroit, Kara embarks on a year of discovery, uncovering unknown strengths, friendships, and first love. Kara's journey illustrates the transformative power of nature, love and loss, and discovering that home can be far from where you started. So I'm gonna start right at the beginning because sometimes I think it's a little confusing if you get dropped right into the middle of a book. Um, and my book is divided up into four different parts. So there's Ecuador, Michigan, California, and then home. And to, uh, to learn where home is for Kara, you need to read the book. Um, but and each section starts off with a quote from a different piece of literature or a poem. And you, know, you can read the book and just ignore those quotes if you want. Uh, it's not gonna take away from the story, um, but I think it adds an extra layer to it if you really think about those quotes too. So I'm gonna start with the, the very first quote. So part one, Ecuador. I wanna stand as close to the edge as I can without going over. Out on the edge, you see all the kinds of things you can't see from the center. And that's from Kurt Vonnegut, piano player. Chapter one. The waiting was the worst. I gripped my worry stone from Uncle Max, turning it around and around in my hands. My fingers probed its golden grooves and contours. The sharp edges shimmered. My teammate Becky sat next to me in the isolation tent, examining her red, white, and blue painted nails. It was the second day of qualifying rounds, and we'd been waiting two hours for our turns to climb. Tiny stars dotted her thumbs. I didn't understand why she bothered. The polish always chipped by the time she finished her climb. My own nails were cut as short as possible, my fingers rough and calloused. A crosshatch of red lines spread across the back of my right hand where I had wedged it into a crack last week, the rock scraping my skin. I couldn't tell yet if it would leave a scar like the other white marks on my hands, the crooked gash on my thumb, my pitted palm. Ugh, Becky said, I want my phone. Seriously, I'm like twitching. Look, she pointed to her eye. Maybe you got mascara in it. 
Her lashes were so clumped and coated, they looked fake. She'd scrolled through her phone at breakfast, tilting it toward me so I could see the picture of her hand placed over her heart like she was reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. She'd managed to display our USA team logo, her cleavage, and her patriotic nails all in one close-up shot. 400 likes. No phones allowed in the tent and no checking out the routes before we climbed. The canvas walls blocked our view of the competition area. A collective groan came from the bleachers outside. Someone had fallen. Another one bites the dust. I tumbled the stone faster and faster in my hands. I swear I could feel its heat, its fire. It's pyrite, fool's gold, Uncle Max had said. Named after fire, it'll spark, spark if you strike it against steel. So they say, wanna try? For the rest of the day, we struck it against anything metal we came across, tent poles, car rims, startling ourselves and giggling every time we saw the tiniest spark. So I'm gonna stop there just to talk about a couple quick things and then I'm gonna turn it over to the next round. Um, so that was pretty much the first page that I read, just a little bit more. And just to give you an idea of how much uh, revision and thought goes into truly every word and sentence in a book, um, this, uh, this page that I read is completely different um, than the page and the whole and the first chapter that I submitted to my publisher, all of this came out in the editing. And I do a workshop called Comparing the Drafts, um, where we look at those differences and really analyze what changed and why I made those changes and how I got to those changes. Um, and it, it's quite a process. So this book was revised continuously over and over again, and even went through so many changes once it was accepted by my publisher. And that first line, something interesting, the waiting was the worst. That's the first line of my book, but it was the very last line to be added. So um, the book was completely done. Um, the advance review copies had been printed and sent off to all the reviewers. And I thought we were done writing. I thought we were moving into the marketing and promotion stage. The book was ready to go to the printer for its first print run. And my editor called me and he said, you know, I think there's just, there's just something in that first paragraph that I think we need to add. He's like, I don't know what it is. So let, let's just, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk it out. And, you know, tell me how, how Kara's feeling right now. And what is she thinking? And so we just started talking. Um, and from Kara's point of view, which most young adult novels are, are very intimate in that teenager's point of view. Um, and I, I said something about, you know, the waiting is really the worst part for her. And we both said, that's it. The waiting is the worst. So that became the first a sentence in the novel that we added in. Um, and if you think about it, it's it starts off, the story starts off in her voice. It starts off with tension. You know, there's some conflict and some challenge that's coming. Um, and it's just a little bit of uh, foreshadowing too. So there's gonna be some more waiting to come later in the story and it's gonna be even more challenging. Um, and it's a little bit of alliteration too, you know, when you start adding poetic techniques to, uh, to prose, you know, with those W's, the waiting is the worst. So anyway, that is about all I have. Um, we have more readers ahead, so I wanna save time for them to read their stories. And maybe, you, I don't know if we have time for some questions now. Um, if, uh, I will be here to the very end. So if you think of anything later, um, you know, ask away then, or you can always contact me um, via my website. I have a contact page mm -hmm. and um, I'm happy to respond. Actually, I'm gonna type my direct email into the chat as well. All right, that's great. So Kristen, I do have a question. Um, I was amazed to read, I don't know if it was in book page uh, or where it was that just as many, if not more adults read young adult novels than young adults do. Yes, so, that is very true. That, I, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I had meant to say that actually. So yeah, um, that is true. And you know, young adult 
young adult novels have sort of had a resurgence lately too. So many of them have been made into mm -hmm. movies. And so that's really expanded the audience. And really, I think it's this universal appeal. Um, and, you know, people often ask me why I write young adult and I don't even know what why my voice comes out that way. Um, I, I think I will write other things. I do write other short stories and poetry that aren't specifically YA, but I think it's, there's something about um, the teenage years where uh, there's a lot of existential questions, right? And we, we all go through these existential phases throughout our, our life at different times. So I think adults relate to that when they read it too. Um, and they're reflecting on their own teenage years and, and the growth that they've gone through too. Yes, yes. Are there any other questions at this point for Kristen? Well, hearing none, we'll go on to our next reader, Jean Alicia Elster. And I just took the direction to unmute. <laughs> so thank you. I thank everyone for coming. I thank Roberta and uh, Barb for inviting me to take part with this. I've been a member of Detroit Working Writers for about 20 years. I joined when it was Detroit Women Writers. So that was quite a while ago. Um, I've uh, got a few minutes here to read. Uh, I just want to say I'm going to be reading from um, my book, The Colored Car. And it's part of a, a two volume series published by Wayne State University Press, Who's Jim Hines and The Colored Car. They're considered middle grade novels, but as Roberta and Kristen were saying, um, we have an, an adult audience. In fact, I think most of my, more of my audience is adult than, um, than young people, which is very, very interesting. Um, so I uh, also want to say it's a very exciting time because there's going to be a third volume in this series. It's going to be a trilogy and uh, it's going to be published in the fall of 2021 and it's called How It Happens. And both Who's Jim Hines and The Colored Car take place in the 1930s in Detroit. Who's Jim Hines in 1935, The Colored Car in 1937. Uh, in both of these books, I mentioned the fact that the mother of uh, each of the protagonists, who was my grandmother, uh, May Ford, uh, looked white. And she could have passed for white. And so in How It Happens, I talk about that aspect of the family history. So this takes place in post-Reconstruction United States. And then also many of my readers want to know, well, what happened to these youngsters when they became older? And so the book also talks about times in post-World War II Detroit. So um, if you're interested or want to know more, please see my website. Uh, it's jeanalishaelster.com. And I believe Roberta is going to put it on the chat page for you. And uh, you can go there every once in a while, bookmark it. Uh, leave your email address if you want to be on my uh, mailing list and I can give you more information when, um, and there's my website, when it gets started. So uh, first I want to read from the prologue of The Colored Car. Uh, this book was um, inspired by my aunt, an experience of my aunt. I was talking to her and she still was very traumatized by an experience she had on a train when she was going south to uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. And that's the part I'm going to read about there where she had to leave her first class, very plush car and go on to what was known as the colored car. So when I read from chapter four, you'll get a little more information about that. Uh, I also like to uh, indicate that um, as much as I admire and um, look up to uh, uh, Rosa Parks, she was not the first one to refuse to give up her seat on a bus or a train or other public transportation. So that's what I'm going to start reading from in the prologue, and then I will go to chapter four. The history of the struggle for civil rights in the United States, the attempt by African Americans to possess basic rights of American citizenship that were denied to them based upon racial discrimination can be studied through the progression of lawsuits filed by black passengers challenging segregation or the separation of blacks and whites 
on the nation's railroads, particularly when traveling in the South. During the 19th and much of the 20th centuries, Black Americans were generally referred to as colored. When traveling in the North, colored passengers could sit according to the class or type of ticket they purchased. The problem came when traveling in the South. Black and white travelers could not sit in the same train cars. And if a train ride started in a Northern state, when the train entered a southern state or crossed what was called the Mason-Dixon line, black riders were made to leave their seats and sit in an all black or colored train car. Over the years, a large number of lawsuits were filed by African-American passengers who had been forced, often dragged from their seats and into segregated cars when traveling on Southern rail lines. However, the law of the land was established by the 1896 U.S. Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. That case held that states had the right to require separate but equal seating for black passengers. This segregation was enforced by what were known as Jim Crow laws in the South and extended far beyond separate seating on train cars. Legalized segregation applied to all manner of public facilities, including theaters, restrooms, public transportation, and water fountains. The effects of the court decision in Plessy versus Ferguson and the notion of separate but equal were far reaching, leaving very few aspects of American public life untouched. It remained the law in the United States for decades to come. Okay, now I'm going to jump to uh, chapter four and read toward the end of that chapter. The train had stopped and the conductor announced from the platform, Cincinnati Union Station. All right, girls, May Ford instructed, gather up your things, get up now, put on your gloves, make sure you have your handkerchiefs. Do you have any peppermints left? No, I didn't think so. Come on, let's go. Patsy and her sister stood and did as they were told. They put on their white gloves and held tight to their handkerchiefs. With baby Annie Mae in her arm, their mother led them off of the train. That same conductor was standing there as they left the car. He directed them and the other colored passengers who were leaving their train cars this way to the colored car. What's the colored car, Mama? Patsy asked. Patsy, you take Laura's hand, their mother said. Follow close to me. It was almost midnight, but the heat was still stifling. With Annie still in her arm, May wiped her forehead and the back of her neck with her handkerchief. Then she took Jean's hand. They walked into the crowd of people on the platform. Some were standing, some walking, some seated on benches. Here we go, girls. We won't have to walk too far, I don't think, their mother said. They walked up to a car. May Ford looked up. Patsy followed her mother's gaze. Above the steps to the train car was a sign with the word colored on it. Last call for Louisville, Clarksville, and Nashville. This is it. Patsy, you and Laura go on up now, their mother said. I'm right behind you. They stood behind a line of passengers, all colored, who were getting on the train car. Patsy led her sister into the car. She stopped in the doorway. It took just a few seconds for her to take it all in. The floor was bare and worn. There were rows of old wooden seats. There was no upholstery, no cushions, no curtains. A rusty pot-bellied stove was situated in the middle of the car. There was soot in the air and she started to cough. She looked up at her mother and said, Mama, this car's dirty. Our dresses will get dirty. Let's go back to the other one. We can't do that. Come on, make the best of it. As May Fort led the other girls to their seats, Patsy stood in the doorway. But it's dirty, Mama. Let's go back to the other car. Why couldn't we just stay in that car, Patsy asked. There were other people staying in that car. Take your seat, Patsy. This is where we'll be until we get to Clarksville, her mother said. Patsy turned and went back down the stairs and stood on the platform. The mother looked at the other sisters and commanded, stay right here, girls. Then she joined Patsy on the platform and grabbed her daughter's arm. Patsy, what's gotten into you? You can't go running off like that. Now get back on the train. Patsy pulled away. Mama, that train car smells. It's dirty. It made me cough. The seats were all crowded together. There are no cushions on the seats. How can we ride all the way to Clarksville in that colored car? 
Oh, sweetheart, it won't be so bad. You'll fall asleep. We'll be there before you know it, bright and early in the morning. All aboard! No, Mama. Get Laura and Jean and the baby. Let's go back. Patsy's <clears throat> voice is aching. Patsy, now stop it. We cannot go back to the other car. We have to ride in this car. We have to ride in the colored car. But why, Mama? Why? Patsy's eyes were filled with tears. Listen, baby. When we leave Cincinnati, we'll be in the South. In the North, where we live, colored people and white people can sit on any train they want. In the South, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, all the Southern states, they want colored people to sit on the train with other colored people. Patsy's mouth dropped open. That's why there were mostly colored people getting off of our train, but I saw some white people getting off too. They probably had business or family in Cincinnati, her mother explained, but if they didn't, they didn't have to leave their seats. Let's get a move on. The gruff voice behind them belonged to the conductor. We'll be on presently, May Ford answered him. She turned to Patsy, held out her hand. Come on now. Patsy stood firm. I don't want to sit in that colored car. Please child, come on. Patsy looked up. She saw Laura and Jean looking out the window. She wanted to be with her sisters, but not in the colored car. Everybody in the car. It was the conductor again. Come on, Patsy. Her mother's voice was firm now, no longer <laughs> pleading. Sweat was beating up on her forehead. If you can't get her up in that car, I will, the conductor said, reaching for Patsy's arm. Don't touch my daughter, sir, May Ford said sternly. The conductor stepped back, looked May straight in the eyes. Veins were bulging out on his forehead. His white face seemed to turn almost purple. What did you say to me, he demanded. I said, don't touch my daughter. May's voice was cold. Patsy, ste Patsy stepped away from the conductor's reach. She was shaking. By that point, people walking by on the platform, colored and white, had stopped and were watching. And I'm going to stop right there. And uh, I'm sure my 10 minutes are about up. I'll be here, as Kristen said, through the whole program. So if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I think I may have neglected to mention the title of the third book in the series, but it is called How It Happens. Okay, so thank you and enjoy the rest of the authors. Thank you, Jean Alicia. Are there any questions for Jean Alicia at this point? If not, we'll go on to our next reader, Barbara Rubick. Hello. <laughs> As Roberta told you, I'm the program chair for DWW. So I enjoy putting this night together with all these fine readers. Uh, myself, I have degrees in teaching English and French. Um, I taught writing to kids and adults for many years. So then when I retired, I decided to challenge myself and write a book. So I did, and in 2015, I published, it is Nola Gals, which is a tale of Hurricane Katrina. I published with a small press. It took a year to research and write the book and five years to publish it. Um, one thing when you write historical fiction, detailed research is vital. So I do a lot of research. And actually, that's my favorite part of writing. I love to do the research. Um, I have worked with the novel in several school districts <clears throat> and schools. Um, the novel has a very strong tie in to To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, I was the writer in residence for five years at Beverly Hills Academy, working with uh, teacher Sarah Coyle in grades six through eight. Um, the eighth graders read both To Kill a Mockingbird and then my book. Uh, and they also produce an anthology of writing each year and I'm gonna share some of that with you later. Um, Nola Gals is a story of two teens, <clears throat> Essence and Grace. Essence, an African, an Afro-American teen, lives in New Orleans with her mom, a nurse, uh, her grandma, Mimi, and her younger sister, Chardonnay. Uh, Hurricane Katrina 
is headed directly at her home. Her mom is at work at the hospital and her stubborn Mimi refuses to evacuate. The hurricane strikes and the girls are marooned in a flooded house with their grandmother. The girls eventually end up on a bus for Houston, Texas, where they meet Grace at the Astrodome. Grace is in disgrace, uh, suspended from school for having an illegal page on her laptop. She is fortunate to live in an affluent suburb of Houston uh, with her parents, one a veterinarian and her dad a psychologist. The family takes in Essence and her sister, but it is not smooth sailing at all as they face bias and loss. Grace has been assigned to read, excuse me, To Kill a Mockingbird as summer reading. And the book actually comes to life for her as she watches and applies its lessons while watching the New Orleans survivors around her. <clears throat> I chose to describe Hurricane Katrina itself with an extended metaphor, which is a long comparison. I compared the hurricane to an angry teenager. And this can be a tricky form of writing as the writer must balance the creative description with the facts behind it. Uh, in other words, the reader has to be able to see the real science of the hurricane behind the creativity of the metaphor. Uh, so here is that extended metaphor. It's on page 21 of the book. <clears throat> she dips her toe into the ocean off the West African shore, peering out to sea, her white dress billowing around her like a silken sail. She has come on the winds from the hot, thirsty Sahara. Restless, she pulls back, shaking loose the scant beads of water from her shimmering leg. Stooping, she runs her fingers through the rough sand, reaching for a seashell. It has been worn by tentacles of wind, sand, and ocean, caressing and lapping round their sinewy fingers, eroding it to a dull roughness. She runs her fingers along the hard crescent shell, turning it to reveal its curled inward cup scraping her long red nails across it. She removes small clumps of errant sand from its spindly surface. Shaking it and banging it with her flat fist, she dumps more sand from the cup. Pulling it to her ear, she listens as centuries of whispers from the sea call to her, sirens luring her on. She looks again to the horizon, clear of life, clear of cloud, clear of destiny. Mother, I shall leave this place. I shall be free. Her voice raises as the wind increases its roar in competition. Spinning, twirling, she lifts into the air, dropping the shell beneath her. Looking down to the wet sand below, even she is amazed at her levitation. What magician is at play? How her mother would be jealous. Flushed with possibility, she moves out over the ocean, her anger rising with her body. Suddenly, she reverses her motion seaward, dropping to the shore once more. She needs the seashell now. <clears throat> As she stoops to retrieve it, grasping it in her right hand, it turns on its own, squirming in her palm, tearing slight cuts as it begins to glow in ashen pink. She holds the shell with her left hand, <clears throat> clamping the right over, and rises again into the darkening air. Ominous clouds are surging over the water, sealing their forces in a counterclockwise spin. The ocean below begins a slow churn as the clouds blacken the air, eclipsing the sun. The clouds suck vapor off the steaming water, reveling in the moist heat, swelling their cheeks. Now she would have her way. Soaring upward, she takes her rightful place, dead center in the black clouds. Raising the seashell before her, at shoulder height, <clears throat> she points it towards the horizon. A divining rod of sorts, it will guide her to freedom, she knows. For days, she rides above the Atlantic on a powerful tropical wave, growing in size and strength, the seashell guiding her. Over the Bahamas, she sucks up the hot waters, quenches her thirst, and moves on towards Florida. There she slows a bit, curious to see this new land beneath her, amused at her power to bend the palm trees perpendicular and flood the streets with torrential rain. 
But then bored, she crosses back over water, howling and spinning over the Gulf of Mexico. Hair in her eyes, lost in dizziness, she holds the seashell up as best she can. Jagged memories of her mother and their fights cut her mind, fueling her determination. She will have her way. She dives like a manic seagull hovering above the surface of the Gulf, her hand reaching down, skimming the surface, filling the seashell with the moist, hot water. Soaring upward, she cuffs the seashell gently, careful not to spill. Guided to the Northwest, in command of the waters and the clouds, she becomes nature, her anger propelling her over the city of New Orleans. She swirls, caught up in the vortex of the storm, clasping the seashell tightly to her chest. Her dress, once slick and twisted across her body, parachutes out around her, puffed against the driving rain. She spins a vein of white marble in the circling black clouds. Laughing, she pushes the seashell out before her and rips it, unleashing a torrent of rain, a surge of water on the helpless city below her. Roaring into the wind, she rants, hear me, I am Katrina. So that's the one I wrote. <clears throat> so I work with students to write their own extended metaphors. We draft and conference and edit, <clears throat> often working hardest at drawing the detailed comparison. Often the most difficult part for them is finding the metaphor that describes themselves as they write poems that begin, I am, and then they have the comparison. Uh, here are a few <clears throat> published in their annual anthology. Okay, the first one is a cardigan. I am a cardigan, my knitted material almost touching the floor, my buttons shining like my eyes, my warmth spreading across my whole body, hanging along my ripped jeans with layers to cover what's on the inside. My comfortability relaxes all over a body, <clears throat> not grasping onto people not attached to school, not wanting fame, low maintenance and easy, gentle to the touch, worry-free, carefree. I am a cardigan. Uh, and here's uh, another one called Thoughts. I am a human, a brain labeled New York, busy, enlightened, connected. I am a city with a growing maze of thoughts, thoughts found under my skin. I am never ending, exploring, I am trains of thought. They come, but never go. I am 46th Street, storage, with an entrance, but without an exit. I am a sign of liberty with just a sprawl. I am electricity, always on, unless a tragedy occurs. Sadness. Remember me because there is no tomorrow. There is only today. I am the city that never sleeps. I am the big apple. I am a mark of history. And the last one I'll read is called Reading Vogue, the magazine. I am fashion, I am pretty, but I am educated. I am as free as Audrey, pretty as Marilyn. I don't like bending the rules, I like breaking them. I perceive the world in colors that are not monochromatic. I dance, 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 and then dance some more. My Dior shoes clicking on the marble floor that I will forever yell in cry in for equal rights and cultural appreciation. For my darlings, my girls, I am Vogue Magazine. I love working with kids and adults too. I think that writing is a really powerful tool for self-reflection and learning. Now, as I'm in charge of this evening, I'm going to take a little shift in pace. I'm moving away from YA for a minute because I'm so excited about my new book, it's adult suspense, and here it is, The Girl from the USO, and it's being released in two days on uh, December 9th. Um, it's a suspense novel <clears throat> that takes place in Detroit, 1941, Pensacola, Florida, and Cornwall, England. It is loosely based on how my own mom and dad met. Uh, he was an RAF cadet who came to Groziel, Michigan for, for flight training and met my mom, a USO hostess. So I am very excited that the Midwest USO in eight states has selected it for its first book club selection. And I will be working with them in a Zoom event on uh, January 27th. So that's it. I got my plug in.
All right, thank you, Barb. Are there any questions for Barbara? If not, we'll go to our next reader, Teresa Nielsen. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank, I'm so happy to be here and thank you to Barbara and, and Roberta for putting this together. This is my book, Last Chance Boys. And I would like to echo what Kristen said. This took me 10 years to write. Lots of hassles and hurdles, but I'm so happy that it's done. And I will start from the beginning with <laughs> chapter one. Harry looked up from his book when the bus came to a sudden stop. He wiped sweat from his brow. The ride had been long and hot. There were two large elk statues, one on each side of the driveway. Harry sat up straight in his seat, taking in the view. It was early spring. There were buds popping up on the tulips along the fence. When Harry closed his eyes, he recalled a memory of his grandpa, bent over in the flower beds, getting the last of the tulip bulbs planted. Harry was only seven at the time, but he loved spending time in the garden with his grandparents. His friends always wondered why Harry wanted to be in the garden, but Harry didn't care. Now here he was at a new place where he and the other boys would be spending the next six months doing time for the things they had done wrong. They would be living on this farm and doing their time, but it would be different. They were given a chance to learn from their mistakes. All right, you guys stay here, said Will. As soon as Will was off the bus, he was approached by an older woman with curly gray hair and a smile on her face. She was wearing faded blue jeans and a brown jacket. She was tall and broad shouldered. Then Harry noticed the small black dog. It reminded him of the one he used to have when he was younger. Will escorted everyone off the bus and asked them to form a line. Harry noticed right away the smell of hay. In the distance beyond the house, he could see a few barns and what might be a corn crib. He felt a knot in his throat. He missed Kenny so much right now. Harry knew that Kenny wouldn't understand why he left. If only he had minded his own business. He could be taking his brother for a stroll in the park and showing him the flowers. If only, Harry muttered to himself, if only doesn't matter, just regrets. Harry, Harry, said Will. Oh, sorry, said Harry. Once Will had everyone's attention, he introduced Mrs. Jardine. Listen up, all of you. I'm sure you would rather be somewhere else, but you're in my courtroom now. Before my husband died, we started this home. It will be yours for the next six months. There are a few rules that we can discuss later. For now, you can unload your things in the cabins. Thank you, Mrs. Jardine, said Will. First, allow me to make the introductions of the boys. This is Mike with the dark crew cut and glasses. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Jardine. Likewise, she said. Will, I would prefer if the boys just call me Mrs. J. It is easier to remember, and I'm used to it. Will nodded his approval. Then we have Harry, who is never without his chewing gum. Harry pushed his hand through his wavy brown hair, his tall figure standing over Mrs. J. The two of them exchanged glances. Harry felt like she could be his grandma. It's nice to meet you, he said as they shook hands. Harry stepped back into the group and listened as Will introduced Ralph, a scruffy, blonde, blue-eyed boy of 13 who had helped out at his dad's lumberyard before his troubles started. Harry and Ralph had grown up in the same neighborhood. Ralph and Mrs. J shook hands. Then we have James. He is the only child of a family that owns a dry cleaning business near Chelsea. Thanks for having me here, Mrs. J, said James. Welcome, nice to meet you. As Harry continued to listen to the introductions of the other boys, he noticed a sparrow flutter to the bird bath in the center of the yard. Tall maple trees and pine trees grew along the fences that surrounded the property. The fragrance of the lavender tickled his nose as he caught sight of an old swing on the open porch. There was an old pickup truck by the barn. It was chock full of hay, and he hoped there were horses nearby. Will introduced Joe, a young boy of 14, who had always been fairly quiet. Next, there was Stan, named after his father and grandpa. Stan was a clean-cut, dark-haired boy who liked to start fights wherever he went. Roger was next, a fair-haired boy, blonde of 13, who was one of the tallest in the group. Each of the boys shook hands with Mrs. J and moved over to stand by the bus. Harry was twirling the frayed laces on his sweatshirt when Will introduced Jack, who everyone knew to be loud and boisterous. Jack's hair was carrot top red, like the men in his family. 
At one time, he tried changing the color by using shoe polish. We have Pete who wears glasses with his curly brown hair and freckles. He is sometimes known as the life of the party. Mrs. J shook hands with Jack. Nice to meet you, she said with a chuckle. At last, Will motioned for Bob to step up to the front of the group. This is Bob. He enjoys cooking when he isn't in school. He is the oldest of seven children. He has twin brothers two years younger than him. And there you have it, said Will. This is our group. Thank you, Mrs. J. Mrs. J said, welcome to all of you. Why don't you go now and unload your things? I'm sure you are all hungry. Come to the main house in, say, half an hour and dinner will be ready. Harry was tired but looking forward to a new start. It was 3.30. On his way to the cabin, he did see a few horses and some cows. Bob tossed his things on his bed and went off with some of the other boys. After Harry unrolled his extra blanket, he settled down on his bed with a pencil and paper. Dear Kenny, I'm so sorry I'm not going to be there for you for a little while. I wanted to write and let you know I'm at my new place. It is a farm where I'm sure there are lots of animals. I will try to write you every day. I hope when mom or someone reads my letters to you, it will make you smile. I hope I get to see you soon. Love you, buddy, Harry. He drew his best drawing of a race car on the letter. Kenny loved race cars. After putting the letter in an envelope and putting the address on, he added the stamp. He would give it to Will to mail for him. Harry tucked his pencil and paper into his bag and left the cabin. It was almost time for dinner. Life as he knew it was going to be different for a while, he suspected. The one thing Harry wanted most, he couldn't have. He needed his brother as much as Kenny needed him. Kenny was three years younger than Harry. He was born with some brain damage. The doctors had told Harry's parents at the time he was born that he would be slow and may never learn to talk. Harry loved his brother. He learned to anticipate Kenny's needs and would feed him and sing to him every morning before he left for school. That is, until the day things began to change for Harry. And that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions for Teresa? Teresa, you had a novel way, pun intended, of uh, sharing your, your books uh, with other people as you and I ran into each other at Menninger Park. Absolutely. Uh, at one of the little free libraries there. So why don't you talk about that? The little free libraries, as most of you know, are throughout Royal Oak and Madison Heights and other areas. And I go to the little free libraries, always looking for a good a book of suspense. And because of COVID and we can't visit one another the way that we used to, I've been putting my books in the little free libraries and um, signing them and hoping that someone will pick one of them up and perhaps reach out because there are two more books in that series and I would love to share them with the young readers as well as Last Chance Boys. And Last Chance Boys, I am working on the sequel to it, which will be out, I don't know, in the next few months or so. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Hey. And our final reader for this evening is Diane Benderbeck Mager. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Diane Benderbeck Mager. I am really excited and honored to be here this evening. Um, thank you so much to Barb and Roberta and the staff at Oriola Public Library for making this evening possible. Like the amazing authors who've read before me, I'm an author with Detroit Working Writers, and I'm also a member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, along with Kristen. My background is as a museum educator, and I've spent most of my career at Cranbrook. I have a master's in the history of decorative arts and a master's in leadership in museum education. Um, I have a few publishing credits as an art historian, but my fiction writing journey only began about four years ago. I took a master's course in imaginative education, how to incorporate imagination and play into experiential learning. And I was working at Etzel and Eleanor Ford House at the time, and I wrote a short story for children 
a journey across the grounds and through the house to share the history of architecture and design in preparation for a family or school visit. But eventually I made the switch from thinking like a museum educator, uh, developing a programming tool, uh, to writing about fictional places with historical design attributes. Over the past couple of years, I've done a ton of background research and plotted out a middle grade adventure series, the Christfirth Trilogy. The books are cryptology quests and they're geared for readers fifth grade and up. And I'm about midway through writing the first book, which is called Christfirth Code One. So um, I will start by reading a teaser for the book uh, we could go ahead and switch my screen for my homepage. Um, when a clandestine cryptology quest, whoopsie here, it's switched me away from my screen. <laughs> so Christfirth Code 1. When a clandestine cryptology quest arrives on the first day of boarding school, 12-year-old Peter assumes it's a hoax, courtesy of his arch enemy Maggie, queen of the twirls. He loves ciphers and gadgets and knows he's smart. Maggie has everyone at Christfirth calling him Peter the Brain. But he worries he's not good enough, destined to fail, just like his father. Peter's worst fears are confirmed when the 1930s journals of Cordelia Altruist, daughter of Christfirth's eccentric founder Augustus B. Altruist, reveal the truth. The Christfirth cryptology quest is real. Its purpose, to stop her father's 120-year-old doomsday mechanism set to flood the circular island Peter calls home. 12 quest challenges propel him across the clock-shaped campus. 12 extraordinary forests, gardens, museums, and schools, seemingly frozen in time, each concealing an encrypted clue. But research alone can't write Christ for some balance. Maggie is determined to solve the quest before him. The devious board president is intent on stopping them and complicated family connections continue to unravel and ensnare. Can Peter trust his friends and enemies combining their five senses to solve Cordelia's quest? Or will rising waters engulf Christfirth as intended, rewarding the conniving board and finally reuniting Altruist's family at sea? So the partial scene I'm going to read, um, in it our main character, Peter, is more than halfway through solving the 12 cryptology challenges. After his relationships with family and friends fall apart over a winter break, Peter finally tells his best friend Allie and her new friend Sam about the quest, seeking their help to solve it before Maggie humiliates him by solving it first. So I'll get started. The carousel's tune faded. Bare birch branches merged into black, silhouetted against the rippling sky. This way, Sam took the lead from Allie, boots crunching through the thin layer of ice covering the path at one o'clock on the Christfirth map. Peter followed, uphill, legs burning, his backpack heavier with each step. Focus, he repeated the challenge puzzle in his head. Mint, conifer shrouds, crystalline chambers, fetid damp, collective combustion. Allie inhaled deeply. We must be close. She spun in a circle, arms wide open. It smells just like a fairyland. Uh, uh, achoo! Peter's nose confirmed. Christ's forest, conifer shrouds. They entered, single file, brushing against textured trunks. Needled boughs whispered overhead. He felt small, the forest immense, enveloping them. Sam clicked his app. GPS says we're nearly there. But won't the official mine entrance be boarded up? Allie asked. My guess, Sam pushed up his glasses. There's an unofficial entrance, hopefully somewhere nearby. Hmm, Allie skipped ahead. Mine's filled with shiny pink marble? We better assume Maggie's already solved this one. Great, here he was, 
having to rely on Sam's navigation skills and Allie's nature knowledge, while Maggie's twirl radar had probably led her straight to the caves without a compass. Peter pulled his own from his pocket, its night glow needle aiming north. Guys, he pointed towards the line of evergreen snaking the base of the cliff. Based on the coordinates listed in A History of Christworth Volume 1, shouldn't we be heading further east? GPS says we're on track, Sam replied. Maybe some of these rocks are magnetic and messing up your reading. Peter tapped the compass. Yeah, you're probably right. Whoa, Allie stopped in her tracks. An enormous boulder rose before them, too tall to scale. It must be a glacial erratic, you know, a giant rock that got left behind as the moon trail mountain shifted and shaped the island thousands of years ago. A second rock, even taller, skirted the cliff, forming a narrow passageway. Allie forged ahead. Sam followed. Peter brought up the rear, feeling his way forward, the filtered moonlight an unreliable guide. Ooh, Allie cried out. Peter jerked his hands from the stone. Did you find something? He imagined one of her spiders. Eight hairy legs, eight beady eyes. Ugh. What's that smell, she asked. Sam coughed, P-U. A waft of cold, wet air filled Peter's nostrils. A tingle, then a twinge. Mold. Oh, oh, achoo, achoo! He stumbled, his right hand reaching for the sharp rock face. Screech, it shifted. Allie spun. What was that? It's a sliding door. Sam placed both hands beside Peter's. They pushed. Screech. Musty air rushed forward. A gap materialized, 12 inches wide. One by one, they squeezed through. Peter switched on his flashlight, safe from the Christfirst watchman's prying eyes. He panned their surroundings. A hollow. The walls shimmered and sparkled. Stagnant puddles festered on the floor. Crystalline chambers, fetid damp, he recited. That about sums it up, Allie breathed through her hand. Deglacial speleogenesis and some time of microorganism. Huh? Peter and Sam jinxed each other. Melting glaciers wash away deposits of marble to form caves. And that smell, she sniffed. Fungi or maybe bacteria. Hold on, Sam held a finger to his lips. I hear moving water. Peter shined his flashlight deeper into the cave. Shadows danced and rippled. Ooh, a second chamber, Allie hopscotched forward. And it smells better too. Peter and Sam followed. A clear, slow moving stream flowed past. Four narrow boats rested beside it. Just like Cordelia described in her journals, Peter murmured, to transport her and the 24 cryptologists to their clandestine club meetings. Cool, Allie began to slide the first boat. Let's lower one into the water. Wait a sec, Peter steered clear of the smelly puddles. Let me tie it off first so it doesn't float away. He passed the flashlight to Sam and tested the nearby metal ring, rusted, driven into the stone decades before but it held fast. He fashioned a quick release mooring hitch knot and together they lowered the boat. Climb aboard, Allie hopped in and took the oars. Peter double checked the knot. No life vests, Sam asked. The flashlight wavered in his hand. Are you sure that thing is seaworthy? Well, it's still floating, Allie stared them down. Sam pointed to Peter, eyes wide. You first, hold it. Could Sam, Allie's hero Sam, have his own kryptonite? He'd definitely worn that same face after he paddle boated with Allie around Christ Lake, but had blamed it on his breakfast burrito. Peter took another peek. Up close, Sam looked a lot like how he'd felt the time Allie convinced him riding the giant Ferris wheel at the city fair would be a blast. He'd made the mistake of looking down. Vomitous. Well, no reason to rat Sam out. Peter climbed in and offered him a hand. Thanks, man. Sam teetered. The boat rocked. Thud. Sam flopped onto the rear bench. The flashlight flew from his grip, overhead, spinning in a slow motion arc. Plop. Total darkness.
be continued. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that's leaving us on a cliffhanger. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Diane? Now, all of our authors who have read are still present with us. So we would enter for any of them. I do have a question for Jean Alicia. Um, you mentioned the title of your third book in the series. Could you tell me that again? She's muted. You're muted. <laughs> How it happened. <laughs> now, is this the book, I, I remember when you won the Kresge Award Fellowship, uh, you had told me you were going to be using the award money towards some research that you were going to do on your next book. Is this the book? Uh, no, actually it's not the book. Um, <laughs> as uh, most writers know, um, let's see. There was something on the screen there. Most writers know we always have a lot of stories going through our head <laughs> at once. And when we're writing one thing, we're plotting another one. And that's just how it is. And we get kind of used to it. So um, when I wrote the, when I won the Kresge Award, and um, there's also another Kresge alum, Elise Alusi. Are you still, uh, you still with us, Elise? You can say something on the chat if you are. But um, uh, the, what I'm going to research with the Kresge funds is a book on my father's side of the family. Um, How It Happens, The Colored Car, and Who's Jim Hines are all my maternal grandmothers uh, and my mother's side of the family. Um, the next book will be based on my father's side. And so I have to do a lot of research. And mm -hmm. one of the other authors mentioned doing research and I literally travel around the country. I like to be in the places that I'm writing about. So much of, uh, in, in fact, almost half of how it happens takes part in Clarksville, Tennessee. And uh, we spent a lot of time there. We visited uh, cemeteries. We visited the place where my grandmother was probably conceived. Uh, we just did a lot of um, um, uh, research, hands-on research. And it helps that my husband is a historian. So he loves this kind of thing. So it doesn't take much for me to say, come on, hon, let's get going and travel. <laughs> so I was traveling to Paducah, Kentucky, to Seal, Alabama, um, East Chicago, Indiana, several places just just to say I, I touched that soil and I, I wanna look at some places that could possibly have some, some family connection. So um, you've probably learned more than you wanna know about how I research <laughs> my books, but it just helps me with my authenticity. And even if something never makes it on a page, it's on the back of my mind. And so it's informing how the characters speak and it's informing what they see. And, and things of that nature. It's um, it's a complex process, but I think I think it works. Okay, thank you. Last call for any questions or any comments. Roberta. Yes. Um, I kind of like to talk among the writers. Uh, I'm curious as to if you look at a book that you write from the very beginnings to the end publication or whatever the ending is. What, what do you think is the most difficult part? Any of you? I'll tell you what mine is having just been through this and I have a book coming out. Um, I hate doing final edits. It just drives me nuts when you gotta go through that whole book again, but looking 
for commas and paragraphing and that drives me nuts. And I found myself, they'd send it to me and they'd say, well, you have 10 days to do this. And I found myself waiting till the like ninth day to ha actually sit down with it. So that's my most difficult part. Anyone else? Revisions. Revisions are like, they take forever, but it's gotta be done. The magic is in the revisions. I always tell kids the learning is in the revisions. <laughs> and I love revising. It's my favorite part. Oh so my goodness. Someone would hand me an outline and I will just take it from there and develop the story and just add those layers and layers and layers. That's my favorite. Oh, wow. I'm right there with Kristen. I absolutely love to revise and I love to edit. <laughs> Well, fortunately, my publisher, Wayne State University Press, uh, does the final editing. They, they pay someone to do that. And in fact, the director of the press was here at the beginning, Stephanie Williams, and I, I didn't get a chance to acknowledge her, but I appreciate that she was here. Um, but my most recent book, How It Happens, went through three total revisions. And I think it's because the book, as I originally knew it was based upon many of the stories that my grandmother told me and um, both of my editors at Wayne State University Press didn't think that was working and so I did one revision with one editor and then my second editor um, basically worked with me through the third revision. I, um, it's not something that I like or dislike. I just know it's part of what you have to do as a writer. Fortunately, I've had excellent editors with all of my books. I trust them completely. And so when they say something needs to be done or a chapter needs to be cut out or something needs to be switched around, I do it because I trust them and they haven't led me astray yet. So uh, for me, it's, it's, it's just part of the... Mm, just part of being a writer, part of my being is revising, reworking, redoing it so that the final product is something that the readers and the folks that were uh, that are out there today, and so glad to see so many of you there, the readers can really grab hold to and, um, and feel that they're a part of the story or at least part of watching the story. Very good info. Uh, we have a question from Margie Marks in the chat. Do you ever read drafts to your audiences for their feedback? I'll start with answering because I know Margie. Hi, Margie. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. I wish I could see your face and see you in person here. Um, I, I have a critique group that will read my drafts. So they're a, a small group of writers that I, I trust their experience and their feedback. Um, and I haven't, I, I haven't gone through that many teens. Um, I will show portions of my book to teens. And actually it was kind of fun um, when my book was accepted for publication and I was still doing that editing. My daughter was, I think, maybe 13 or 14 at the time. So she was the perfect age to, to read um, my novel since it was young adult. And so I got her feedback, which was great. And she, you know, pointed out all kinds of small things that I wouldn't have even thought about, even small things like clothes that, you know, the, the character wouldn't wear that. Um, so that was really helpful. Uh, one of the things that I did working with um, the middle school kids we would write together. So I would write a piece while they were writing the same piece. And then we would conference them and we'd use the, the full screen to put each paper up and we'd go through them all. That was really effective. And I learned a lot from the kids too. I've also learned a lot from my critique groups too. And they're very helpful and beta readers. I have never had a critique group and uh, actually don't want one, but I know I just kind of use my editors. Uh, I, one person that I do allow to read is my son. He's a, a professional writer, he's a journalist, he's an editor in Pittsburgh for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And so I, I let him read the first chapter of How It Happens. That's the third book in the series. And he gave me 
just gave me two sentences that were very insightful and really helped me plot the rest of the book. He's the only one. I never let my husband read it because he's a historian and he just doesn't understand fiction. He just understands history books. And it's, it, um, we wouldn't still be married if I, if I let him read the book. So, I'll just... <laughs> so um, but no, so whoever asked that, um, I don't read drafts um, to anyone um, other than my editors. Um, I would add that I've definitely worked with critique groups, but currently I'm just working with one other author and we serve as uh, critique partners and also accountability partners. And I found that to be uh, really helpful that we're alternating pages uh, every two weeks. And so that really keeps you on track. So it sounds like everyone makes sure that their work is polished before they read it in front of an audience. All right, any other questions or comments that people have for our readers tonight? If not, I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank our readers, Kristen Bartley Lenz, Jean Alicia Elster, Barbara Rubick, Teresa Nielsen, and Diane Vanderbeck Mager, and also the staff of the Royal Oak Public Library, Matt Day, and Ed Pank. I'd also like to thank everybody for coming. And um, I would like to organize another such meeting. Uh, sometime next year, if, if, if everybody's interested, of course. Uh, and I'm hoping that maybe by the second half of next year, uh, we can resume having in-person programs instead of Zoom programs. Uh, I think you, you, you lose a lot of it when you translate it to Zoom. Uh, it's not quite the same experience as you probably know. But I, I hope that everybody is interested in participating. Uh, and I will open up a dialogue um, with DWW and explore that possibility soon. In the meantime, I want to wish everybody a happy holiday too. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Matt. Mm. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you, Kristen. Bye. 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 Bye.